and welcome to Deakin's Virtual Open Day. My name is Catherine. I'm the course director for the Bachelor of International Studies, and I'm joined by Tony, who is part of the International Studies course team. We're thrilled to have you with us as we explore the International Studies courses. We'll be also hosting a live Q&A session after this information session to answer any questions you may have. You can start writing your answers or your questions in the, the panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and these will be responded to during the live Q&A session. As we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in doing so, recognize the various traditional lands on which we do our business today. Deka would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which our university campuses are based. The Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation on whose country our Geelong campuses are located. The Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose country our Burwood campus is, is, is located. And the Peak Wurrung people of the Ma Nation on whose country our Wurrungal campus is located. I myself am located on Wadawurrung country and on behalf of us all, I pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional custodians elders and ancestors of all the lands from which you may be joining our gathering today. I express our gratitude for their care of country, which continues to sustain us as it has done for millennia. Education has a long and rich heritage on this continent, which we aim to honour and reflect in the ways we teach and learn. The session today will cover the value of studying international studies, course details for the Bachelor of International Studies, Global Scholar and Combined Degrees, work integrated learning options during your degree, career development support available through core units and experiential learning opportunities, such as internships, and graduate employment outcomes for students. If you're interested in different cultures, languages, and perspectives outside of your own, the Bachelor of International Studies and Combined courses give you an experience rich and deep understanding of the international forces shaping the world today. The Bachelor of International Studies is a degree that can take you anywhere. The Bachelor of International Studies is focused on equipping you with the skills you need to live, work and thrive in domestic and international environments. We have real world experiences and guaranteed support and access to a suite of local and overseas work integrated learning opportunities, which are woven throughout the degree. These experiences range from short term programs at international locations through to international internships with our global partners. We have career and employment preparation and support by Deakin Talent to help you gain an edge when entering the job market. International studies doesn't just take place internationally. Throughout our degree, we look at the way international forces shape our everyday experiences. We champion the idea of internationalizing your education through virtual and domestic programs and activities centered around travel, cultural and global engagement. The Bachelor of International Studies is focused on equipping you with the skills you need to live, work and thrive in domestic and international environments. The skills you learn in your international studies degree through core units and your major studies are critical for career success internationally. They include an understanding of what it means to be a global citizen, knowledge of intercultural communication strategies, and high level critical and reflective thinking capabilities. For course details and entry requirements, please visit the Deakin website. Entry requirements may change and you're encouraged to check VTAC or Deakin University website for all entry requirements. For non-school leavers, the entry requirements can be found on the Deakin website and please check for any updates to these requirements. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact with our admissions team. For the Bachelor of International Studies students, you must successfully complete 24 credit points of study, including six core units, an eight point major selected from the major sequence, international experience, a second major or minor. The Bachelor of International Studies A326 degree is the most flexible course in the suite of international studies degrees offered at Deakin. In this degree, you have the option to study a second major or minor sequence, and you also have the most elective units of all international studies degrees. If your goal is to keep flexibility in your degree, then this may be the preferred course for you. When you study any Bachelor of International Studies degree, you gain an understanding of globalization and development, global power and capitalism, and build your intercultural communication skills through core units. In your first year, you will study intercultural communication and working in international contexts. These units are designed to get to think about your current skill level and how you want to plan your international studies journey. In your second year, you will develop or you will study global capitalism and power and gender globalization and development. These units give you a good grounding in international relations and an understanding of the forces that shape key political and ethical problems such as global financial crisis, global poverty, corporate power, climate change and unaccountable global governance. And in your final year, you'll study the capstone portfolio unit and international futures. 
These units help you to consolidate your international studies knowledge and help you to communicate these skills and attributes to future employers. Tony, uh, as the unit chair of one of our first year units, Intercultural Communication, can you tell us a little bit about what students can expect in this unit? Uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, the first thing they can expect, I guess, is to be interested and energised with the first year unit. And that's what intercultural communication is. It's a really, I guess it's, it's a very uh, hands-on, very practice-based unit. We look at theories and ideas and concepts, all the stuff you would expect in the unit. But at the same time, we ask students to go and to look at their own cultural identity, their own background, where they live. We have assignments based around how is your identity formulated by where you live and how you've grown up. So it, it's one of those subjects that is really um, ongoingly active, engaging, kind of gripping. So we, we do look at things like racism, um, things like the acknowledgement of country and what comes next. So we look at um, politics, local and geopolitics. We look at uh, language, nonverbal communication, the way we make meaning, what we what we read and see in the press. Uh, we even look at um, racism in online dating in preferences. So it's a it's one of those units that's I guess pretty dynamic. It's pretty contemporary, and you know at the moment we're looking uh, really closely at things like messaging in the media around election issues. So it tends to be a, a fairly contemporary subject. It, it changes year by year. Uh, and the assignments are written in a way that everyone can put their own perspective into that work. So it's, it's a really great unit. It's a fairly large unit. So you meet a lot of people from all around the world. That's the other really great knock-on effect is that you'll meet people from you know, 20 other countries. And, and so it's not just theory, it's practice. Fantastic. Now, Tony, just a quick question about that unit. Um, you said that you, know, you, you are studying with potentially students from anywhere in the world, how can you take this unit? Can you take it online? Does it have to be on campus? What's the sort of, what could students it, expect from a unit at Deakin in terms of how they would experience that? This is this is a good example, I guess, in that there's many modes that you can do it in. It's offered across um, Geelong campus, Burwood campus. It's offered virtually via uh, Zoom. We use cloud resources. Um, students will use chat functions outside to talk to each other socially. So it's it's one of those units that kind of grew and developed a bit as a result of COVID. And now it is multimodal and each experience is genuine and as good as the other. So that's one of the most exciting things to come out of COVID, I guess, is that now you can do it in a whole range of ways. And students mix and match a little bit as well. You know, people are um, unwell for a week or away, or they can catch up. So yes, I would say to students, it really doesn't matter how your personal life structured or what your commitments are, we can find a way in this unit to, to, to study. Thanks so much, Tony, really appreciate that. Okay, so uh, in the Bachelor of International Studies, we have eight majors to select from, and they include anthropology, international relations, Middle East studies, politics and policy studies, and our languages are Arabic, Chinese, Indonesian, and Spanish. Around 75% of our students end up majoring in international relations. And when selecting a major or a minor sequence combination, you should really consider selecting complementary major and minor sequences. For example, with international relations, anthropology is a really complementary major or minor sequence to actually pair with that. So when you're looking at your sequences and you're looking at the combinations, do put a little bit of thought into what it is exactly you'd like to actually complete and, and how they fit together. So a popular way to complete the Bachelor of International Studies is actually by combining it with a Bachelor of Laws or Commerce degree, or also adding a Diploma of Languages. And this means that you're extending the qualification that you have when you study at Deakin, you can add a combined course or add a diploma even after starting your degree, which highlights the flexibility of studying at Bachelor of International Studies at Deakin. Many students choose to engage in additional study whilst already undertaking a degree at Deakin. So if you're interested in studying a Bachelor of International Studies, but you're not quite sure which degree you want to choose, be confident in the knowledge that you have the flexibility to add the, these options after commencing your degree. And I encourage students to think about these options after studying around about during their first trimester at Deakin. So don't hesitate to contact Student Services or me when you're studying your degree to discuss these options once you've commenced your degree. Now, a little bit about the Diploma of Languages. Uh, and it's a really popular addition, as I said before, to study alongside 
the Bachelor of International Studies. You can undertake a diploma of languages if you're new to the language with no previous experience required. We can tailor a learning program to your individual needs depending on what your current language ability is. And your language ability can be zero. Uh, you do not have to have any, any knowledge of your language or the culture from that language as well. If you have a background in a language, however, you're able to enter the units at a higher level than those with no language experience. One of the key pieces of feedback we received from both industry and government is that it's so critical for students to be able to speak a second language. I encourage all students to consider taking language units as part of your studies. And if there's a language that we don't offer, please ask us about the opportunities of cross-institutional enrollment. So the Global Scholar Program, uh, or the course code A306, is designed for high achieving students. In this degree, you'll proactively build a professional portfolio of international experiences while learning about the forces that shape government, business and society through Australia and the world. Students who undertake the Global Scholar Program are required to include a language and international relations as either a minor or a major combination part of their program. This program also includes a $3,000 scholarship to support you while you complete the required internship as part of your studies. The Global Scholar Program helps you understand how events of the past have contributed to today's environment and apply transversal and analytical skills to reflect on the past and tackle the future. You learn what it takes to establish and maintain a professional presence as an international relations professional, as well as building a graduate portfolio that highlights the key learning outcomes you've acquired throughout your degree. This degree has limited places, which are governed by grant availability. High achieving students are encouraged to consider taking this option. So whichever and whatever international studies degree uh, you choose to complete, you must complete between two to four credit points of international experience. Prior to COVID travel restrictions, students typically undertook these experiences located internationally. However, since COVID related travel restrictions, we've seen a significant increase in students completing virtual experiences and a shift towards domestic internships with organisations that are working across cultural boundaries. We guarantee you the opportunity to engage with various programs that enhance your employability and international skill set, whether you choose to undertake these experiences internationally or closer to home. You can apply to complete faculty-led programs like study tours to Japan and India, short-term partner programs located globally at institutions in Europe, Asia and Africa, there are also exchange programs between multiple universities around the world and Deakin that you would usually complete in your second year of study. Students undertaking language study also have an in-country language program available to them. If you are considering exchange and you would like to complete your studies at another university during your second to third year of study at Deakin, third if you're doing a, a combined degree, then really you should start thinking about that at around about the first middle of the first year of your study because they can take a little while to set up but are very rewarding if you do that. International internships located both domestically and overseas are a fantastic way to combine the knowledge you've acquired throughout your degree and apply them in real world situations. And finally there are numerous volunteer programs uh, to locations including Peru, Costa Rica, Vietnam and virtually to get you started on your experiential learning journey. One of the key components of the International Studies degree at Deakin, at Deakin University is the choice for students to undertake international experience in a country of your choice. At Deakin, we create bespoke programs for students so you can let us know where, is, where in the world you want to go, what you want to do there, and we'll work with our teams to provide you with the best guidance on how we can get you there safely so you can get the most out of your experience. It's always wonderful to see the variety and scope of the international experiences that our students undertake. And we're thrilled that global borders are starting to open up again so we can support our students to travel. Even as travel restrictions are being eased, however, virtual programs are here to stay. They offer flexibility in their design and they give you the, uh, the ability to work in multiple locations globally. Our international experiences reflect the experiences of our changing international world. We're adapting to the types of roles and experiences that our students are needing in the future to meet industry demands. Our current advice to students is to try to engage with at least one virtual experience during your degree, as it's the best preparation for graduate employment. We have multiple options to complete your international experience virtually, including a faculty-led humanitarian action team internship, humanities industry team internship, Japanese virtual immersion program, and individual and group international and domestic internships. 
Moving our experiences virtually has been one of the highlights of the last couple of years for our team. Our student feedback from these experiences has been overwhelmingly positive. One example of these virtual programs is one that I had the privilege of running over the last two years, which is the Japanese Virtual Immersion Program. We had such a rewarding time exchanging cultures between Deakin and Masashi University students. Our program, uh, normally located uh, in Tokyo, is a mixture of lectures, Japanese language classes, cultural activities, site visits, and group activities, all shared with Masashi students. When we deliver this program virtually, the program is largely similar to our in-country program, with some additional intercultural group work challenges for students to complete. Some of the highlights of the program are our international snack exchange and neighbourhood walking tours, where our students get to experience what is important to each other. Tony, uh, can you please tell me a little bit about the Humanities Industry Team Internship Program that you've been running over the past two years? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, and that's good advice you gave earlier about planning in first year for your third year experience. That's a, that's a really key thing to remember. And a virtual experience is a, is a great thing to have at that point in your, in your career. The HITI project, as we call it, the Humanities in team, team Internship, We've had some really great ones and I can't talk about the whole lot. I haven't got time, I would love to, but I don't. But one that really stood out was a virtual internship we did with a disability um, advocacy group in Kuching in Borneo in Sarawak. Um, and so we were based in Australia, they were based in Kuching and we worked with them to help them develop um, marketing, planning, sales, websites. If you're keen, you can search for heart treasures and you can actually see the work done by the students um, through our freelancing hub and our HITI projects. We come up with uh, new ones almost every semester. They're quite different in their approach. They're, they're meaningful and really engaging. The one with Heart Treasures really was a great experience for our students in Australia to, to work with um, Malaysian uh, advocacy and um, politically very astute people in the international social welfare space. So it was a great mixture of, of interpersonal and very professional work as well. We've also done uh, some local experiences uh, in the HITI project. Students are also now increasingly doing their own. We've got students working on clean, virtual clean water projects. We have some students that are working on a Kenyan girls health project. So whilst we're stuck in Australia, stuck in Australia, um, we are still doing these things in the real world in another country. And that's been probably one of the best things to come out of COVID is that you can do real things in a virtual space. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of one of the great things about working virtually is that, you know, right now we are currently working virtually. So it is very much reflective of how the world has changed over the past couple of years and this huge shift towards the towards the virtual. Yeah, you should be thinking other. about engaging with that during your degree. Yeah. And one of the other things is that students who are overseas who can't get to us are also involved in these projects. So they're sort of you know, they're, they're international virtual times too. Absolutely. And we often have teams uh, made up from people located uh, internationally or across all of Australia as well. So there's that access angle that we, we really like with our virtual programs. Uh, so no matter what happens with our borders, um, we will have opportunities for you to engage in this space. Okay, so... Um, a work integrated learning experience can take your learning beyond the classroom, as we were mentioning before, and help you to get career ready. A work integrated learning program can include interning, traveling, mentoring, or volunteering. Uh, we have multiple partner universities across the world that offer global learning as programs that can be delivered virtually or in person uh, when international travel is permitted. Internships provide a really great opportunity to use business communication in industry contexts and that are a great way to strengthen interpersonal communication in a real world context. You never know what you might end up doing in an internship, including managing social media accounts, uh, to writing policy briefs and research and field work. Deakin University also provides grants and scholarships for students to support their work integrated learning. Uh, and that's to ensure that students can access these really vital opportunities. Tony, um, you are one of the, you know, uh, lecturers in work integrative learning, uh, one of the key lecturers in work integrative learning in the Faculty of Arts and Education. Can you tell us about how some students from international studies or just across the arts and education uh, field have completed will in their courses? Sure, Ken, and you're right that um, this is a, a key part of 
kind of taking what you've learned in the in the lecture hall and, and in the tutorial rooms to the real world a little bit testing what we told you and seeing how it holds up in the real world it also will is a great chance for you to sort of energize a little bit as well that if you're interested in you know in international relations going and working for the women's information referral and exchange group for a while is a really potent way to kind of re-energize your batteries and put theory into practice will is also another really great opportunity for you to take all the stuff that you learned in intercultural communication and and apply it go out and test your skills as an intercultural communicator it's a great chance to meet other people from other areas as well, because quite often our will experiences are a mixture of students across quite a few disciplines. So that's a great opportunity to sort of practice networking as well. And you get to do things. Let's be honest, you get to go to the classroom and um, I jokingly say, welcome to Deacon, now go away. Um, not true, but we you know, go away internally uh, and, and practice a little bit. Will is uh, one of the things that I think everyone should have somewhere in their placement second year is a great chance to do a like a like a study tour like you were talking about an immersion program and a third year is a really a chance to do something like go out and work um, with through an organization so our students in international relations will go off and work on unesco projects and um, uh, united nations based projects they'll work for small ngos and npos on like you said a social media campaign um, Eat Local was a small one around food equity and um, resourcing. There's such a range of projects that uh, it's worth checking almost week to week about work integrated learning. And uh, I also do it, make sure you've got space and do work integrated learning. It's a great one in terms of things like even employability, it gives you something on your resume that looks different to others and it gives you something to talk about and it, it creates your own sort of brand as well. So Will serves a whole lot of purposes. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Tony. And I think that you put that really well uh, when we were talking about um, maybe pitching it at different year levels. Uh, you know, in your first year, you might start to do kind of that foundational study, thinking about how you're going to be planning your, your journey at Deakin, uh, what will experiences you want to engage with. The second year is kind of like that tasting kind of place of, you know, putting your foot in the water and going, okay, what programs um, can I engage with that, that give me a little bit more of a grounding, maybe volunteering, maybe um, more faculty-led programs, or maybe even an internship there as well, a shorter internship. And then in that third year is really kind of that, um, that capstone almost internship experience that really is the culmination of your studies where you can really apply them in, in the field. So I think that's really fantastic advice. Thank you for that, Tony. Okay, so the learning experiences um, at Deakin uh, are designed to be engaging, including simulations, Model UN, industry engagement and internships, just to name a few. Much of the feedback that we get from recent graduates is how important engaging with extracurricular student clubs and associations is, as they allow you to get out of your comfort zone and get more involved in the student experience while at university. We have some great clubs and associations at Deakin and links to external organisations that help you to build professional networks. If you are in your first year of study at Deakin, please ensure that you're in at least one club or society uh, because that will be how you really build up your network and having a network at university is really critical uh, to be able to rely on, but also for that kind of next stage, you know, when you've finished your university studies and what you're going to do, that kind of core network is a really critical thing for your career success long term. Okay, so internships and what we were talking about before with some of the volunteering experiences uh, they can be completed at a variety of organisations. Tiny mentioned non-government organisations. There's also government bodies and agencies. Uh, we have a lot of students interning at embassies and consulates, both in Melbourne um, and also Canberra um, and also internationally. So you might find yourself working at you know, an embassy in Melbourne, uh, so say a foreign embassy in Melbourne, but you might also find yourself working in an Australian embassy internationally. Uh, which is a really interesting space to work in. There's also private companies working across cultural boundaries, and this is really that uh, has been that area that's expanded over the last few years where uh, the work that organisations do internationally, and that can be on things like supply chain logistics or um, you know, managing cultural capacities within their organisation, has become more and more critical. So these private organisations and companies, we might find them domestically and they are doing some really fantastic work. 
So completing an internship is required in the Bachelor of International Studies Global Scholar degrees. So that's the A306 degree. And whilst those studying the other Bachelor of International Studies degrees are not required to undertake an internship, in your final year, an internship is strongly recommended as it creates fantastic opportunities to utilise the disciplinary knowledge that you have in that professional context. Okay, so um, what's interesting about where international studies can take you is that what you study uh, no longer really defines or limits your career outcomes. Having a university degree is highly valued by employers, no matter what that degree is in. Recruiters are more interested in the transferable skills rather than discipline specific skills. International studies gives you a high level of intercultural competencies, starting off with the unit that Tony was talking about earlier, intercultural communication. It also gives you advanced communication and interpersonal skills. And many graduates have a competency in a specific language and often end up working in a wide range of emerging fields. Now more than ever, the world needs people that can make a positive impact. One of the greatest things about working internationally is that there's always something new to learn and interesting opportunities to engage in. Uh, so take advantage of these moments by saying yes to the things that you don't think you can do. Learn a language, connect with industry by interning, uh, join a deacon club, society or networking event and go for opportunities even if you think they may be out of your reach. You never know what you're going to learn or who you're going to meet. Okay. Deakin Talent are an absolutely fantastic organisation at Deakin and part of our fabric for supporting graduates. They're there to support you with your career development whilst you're a student and also when you're a graduate. And they make sure that you're career ready. They offer a wide range of support for students and graduates, including one-on-one -on -one career coaching, resume and job application support and employer and networking events. They have on-demand services, which provides universal access for all Deakin students and graduates. They have guided programs, which include face-to-face -face workshops, career coaching and professional development programs open to all students and graduates. And that's those that are on campus or based in the cloud. And we also have these um, elements embedded within our curriculum, which are contextualised and scaffolded into our core learning units at Deakin. They really start in our first year uh, through our units and then go all the way through to our portfolio capstone unit, where our students really communicate what they've learned in their degree and learn how to communicate that to future employers. So our students choose majors that align with their interests. Uh, Ruth said that she chose Deakin because she wanted to be in a university which cared about her personal development and provided her with the opportunities she'd need to thrive in the future. Somewhat gratifyingly, she states that we've already exceeded her expectations and we look forward to uh, supporting Ruth in her studies at Deakin. I encourage all prospective students and current students to know what scholarships and financial assistance may be eligible for them uh, to support their journey at Deakin. For those that are applying uh, through Deakin, we have three pathways, uh, direct uh, application, non-school leavers uh, through VTAC and international students are on the next page. So if you're joining us today as an international student and would like to learn more about applying to Deakin, fees, scholarships and studying at Deakin, you may wish to attend one of the information sessions run by our international study experts. You can find these sessions on the schedule page. You can also speak to our international team and web chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you interested in international studies. If you'd like to learn more, please explore our resources on this page or across the virtual Open Day website. We just encourage you to stick around for the live Q&A session, which is about to kick off. Our campus Open Days are finally back this August, uh, which is really exciting. So don't miss your chance to get further course and career information in person and tour our campuses. We hope that you've had a fan this session valuable and that you enjoy your virtual open day experience. Enjoy the rest of your day. Hello and welcome to the International Studies live Q&A session. I'm Catherine, the course director of the Bachelor of International Studies. And today I'm joined by our presenters, Tony, who is a lecturer in work integrated learning, Kai, who is an associate professor in international relations, and Riley, one of our international studies students majoring in international relations and politics and policy studies. If you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A section in the question panel on this page. We'll do our best to respond to all of your questions during this session. If you have any unanswered questions at the end of the session, our team of experts will be available on web chat to, all day to assist with any questions, including any specific international student related admissions questions or fees queries. At the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll notice a yellow chat now icon. Please click on this after the session to be connected with our team. 
Okay, to kick us off, we have our first question for Kai from Ava, who asked, can you do more than one language? Uh, good question and excellent to be looking at languages to start us off. Um, yes, if you're doing the straight, so the, the main Bachelor of International Studies degree, you could fit in two languages. Um, so that would be either a major and a minor or two majors. Um, and as part of that, you would have an opportunity for in-country study with both if you wish to. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Kai. Uh, Tony, Penny's asked, what are the types of jobs you find that international studies students or international studies graduates end up in rather? Oh, wow. Um, there's a big question, actually, with, with a lot of answers. Um, I'm going to say everywhere and anywhere to begin with, and I'll get a bit more precise. Now, um, people end up working for um, NPOs, NGOs, so non-profit and um, non-government organisations. They work for local council. They work for international organisations. They work um, in embassies, large corporations in their international departments, a whole range of places. We see our graduates go to places that we didn't quite expect, but we're not surprised to see them there. Because um, you end up with a really good set of skills, particularly if you team it up with some experiences. So everywhere, anywhere, particularly with an interest in international affairs, international work, humanitarian assistance, social change and reform, and they're really good at finding a, a pathway for themselves. So I know that's a pretty big answer. Um, it's it's not like they go here, they go lots of places. Fantastic. And I think that that breadth is really interesting as well to kind of understand that this degree doesn't have very direct pathways. It has you know, a, a huge variety of options for our graduates. Um, Kai, I've got a question that gets asked a, a lot by uh, potential students, and that's from Kate. Uh, and that's what's the difference between international relations and international studies? Yeah, great question, um, and one particularly because we do tend to use them a bit interchangeably. So for our purposes at Deakin, International Studies is the course which comprises of core units, the major, major or two majors possibly, um, and then the electives that you take. So it describes that overarching experience that's going to be a variety of things. International relations refers to a smaller area looking at international politics effectively, and particularly the relationships between states. And it is the most popular major within the Bachelor of International Studies. So around about 70, 75% of students do take international relations as their major or one of their majors. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Kai. Very concise. Um, now, uh, Riley, I've actually got a question for you as our student ambassador. Can you tell us a, a bit about your plans for your international experience? Because I know that that's something that students are very interested in. Yeah, easy. So I started this course back in 2020 when COVID first hit. So I had a lot of dreams and aspirations for my international experience. I'm um, going to the UN. I was going to go to South Korea last year to do North Korean human rights. Um, I'm currently looking to do a Japan experience, which has come through the university um, to learn all about Japanese culture and the politics that they have um, to really get that sense of understanding from, you know, the international experience. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Riley. Uh, now, Tony, I've got a question for you about internships, thinking about that kind of same theme there. Um, what sort of placement experience or um, internships do our students end up doing? Um, I, I get to give the big answers. I, I say lots all the time. Uh, but it's the case again here. Um, students' internships, when I think back to the last two years, have had a change, not surprisingly. And um, we've been doing more things virtually, but still with an international focus. You know, we've we've been working with a partner in Borneo, for example, in Kuching, um, looking at disability rights and arts um, activism in um, Malaysia, which was really exciting. We work um, with local partners as well. We've been doing some work with the National Trust, um, we're about to, to do a big project with um, the um, big idea, the, the new new sort of social enterprise, social welfare, big issue approach. So that's the kind of bigger stuff. That's the group stuff. And then there's the individual students who find the most amazing and sort of uh, enlightening projects themselves and, and go and work for an organisation that has a focus that they're interested in. We rely really heavily on our will team, work integrated learning team. Um, to do that sort of engine room stuff with quite a bit of organisation. So I've had students go uh, to uh, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines before COVID. I've had mid students working in midwifery projects, um, BIS students who have worked uh, in Kenya 
on um, language programs, on uh, physical and mental health programs, really broad. Um, we've even had students that have gone over and worked on a, a, a clean burning stove project as part of climate change activism in Peru. So I have currently have my fingers crossed. You can't tell, but I've got my fingers crossed. Those things will all slowly come to life again. They are. Um, and we'll have a mixture of domestic, virtual and overseas placements really from here on in. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Tony. Um, now, back to you, Kai. I think that there's a really interesting conversation that, uh, you know, we started with languages, but Deakin doesn't offer every single language. So what happens if, uh, say, a student wants to study French as part of the BIS? Can they do it at Deakin? Yeah, great question. And I mean, particularly given that we have got the four main languages at the moment. Um, if you wanted to do French, it is still possible via a mechanism called cross-institutional enrollment. So what this would mean is that you can enroll at another university at a convenient location for you that offers French or the course that you want. So this might be Japanese, another language, um, and then you can still get credit for it towards your deacon degree. So it's it's one of those sort of push, pushing it together and making sure that you've really got all of the, the opportunities to, to make the degree what you want it to be. Fantastic. And I think that that's something that uh, Deakin really excels at, that cross-institutional enrolment. So it's a fantastic question there. Okay. Um, so let's go uh, maybe back to Tony here. What can I do to study or give myself a better chance of getting a job in my field? Oh, I think... Um, this is probably a good combination answer um, in that we can hear from what Riley is doing at the moment himself, you know, uh, and also I can answer that a little as well. Um, a whole range of things and people develop. I and mean, when we sort of loosely call it a, a portfolio or a show reel, reel, or I talk about you distinguishing yourself from all the other applicants as well. So people will put together um, a, an experience and a study plan that, kind of shows what they're capable of, what they've done, what they're interested in to employers. Uh, working about learning again is really helpful here. Um, forms of experiential learning are really useful, particularly towards the end of your degree. But I think in second year, they're just as valuable because um, they're a chance to test the stuff that we teach you in the classroom and to tell people, okay, I've learned it and here I've applied it. So for example, I would think of students who are studying a double degree, maybe in criminology as well. They do a lot of internships with Corrections Victoria, the justice system, Victoria Police, um, and those sorts of hands-on applied learning are really useful. And we'll teach you how to represent that on your resume. So how to sell that to people. Well, you know, I'm not just like every other graduate. Here's how I'm a bit different. And here's how you bring those stories to the front and show people. So um, what about Riley, how do you, what, what do you kind of think that would you'd like to do? You've already touched on it a bit, Riley, with your, your study tour idea. Um, I feel like the biggest thing is probably connections. So what I was previously doing with South Korea was through my lecturer who did her thesis on Korea. Um, and that's pretty much, I feel like the best way to kind of get that into the dream employment um, is just talking with people, especially your lecturers and unit chairs, because you guys are all experts in your field um, and you guys have connections to then lead on to further connections. And it's always kind of good having that connection originally before applying to a place that you have no connection with other than you're interested in doing it so definitely that's what I find personally the best way to kind of get into that field is using your international experience to go into that field before you even graduate graduate with your degree fantastic thanks Riley and Tony for that uh that answer there really great work there um Kai I might uh go back over to you and you know, talk about this international experience a little bit more. Um, does it cost students extra? And can they do more than two credit points of international experience? Uh, two big questions and important ones. So um, let's take the, you know, the money one first, and then we'll come on to how much can you fit into your degree. Um, the basic situation is, is that a lot of the time for overseas programs, we've been very successful at getting supporting funding, particularly through the New Colombo for LAN. So, for example, the Japanese immersion program that's running is supported by New Colombo plan this year. 
Um, there are also a variety of grants and support funding that's available. This does change over time, so I'm not going to name particular ones, but check in with the Will team and they can tell you what support is available. There is also specifically for overseas programmes that meet certain criteria regarding length. Also, OS Help is available for those as well. So there are a variety of different funding mechanisms, some of which are grants, some of which are loans. Um, beyond that, if you are in the position where you're not able to spend additional money and you're not looking to spend a long time abroad do remember that international does not have to mean overseas and it doesn't have to mean a great big chunk of time out of your you know, your normal life these are flexible placements and certainly we've got plenty of students who've got caring responsibilities who've got part-time jobs families that don't allow them to swan off to europe for a year um, and, you know, the commitment really is to make sure that you can still have a really meaningful international experience as part of that. This might be on a part time basis, say, through an internship working with an ethnic council, it might be with a local business. It could also be a combination of project placements and so on. So don't feel that not being able to go overseas is going to be a barrier, either for financial reasons or because of your, your personal circumstances. Coming on to what people do for their international experience and how much you can fit in, two credit points is the absolute minimum. Um, and that will generally be possibly a placement at level two or a study tour, and then an internship at level three. Um, we have had students manage to fit in up to, I think about 14 different international experiences over the course of their, their studies. Now, not all of them were for credit. Some of them were shorter term things that were still facilitated by the university. But if you are looking to really get out there, make the most of it, then certainly it's possible to do far, far more than just the two credit points. You could probably fit in two to three internships, plus some different group placements, plus short term study abroad. Um, so the main thing is start thinking about it early. Um, I think Riley's picked up on this really well, is start thinking about the sort of experiences, the sort of spaces that you want to explore. And then effectively, the combination of the academic staff and the Will team, our job is to help you do that. Fantastic. And uh, sorry to put all of those questions at once on you there, Kai. Um, Tony, I've got another question for you, and maybe even Riley, you could answer this one as well, because, you know, as a BIS student, you've got a very first-hand experience here. What's the main difference between the BA and the BIS? Want me to start? I'll start, Riley. Um, probably the, the biggest distinguisher is this, the specialisation and the focus of the BIS, you know, that you, you can actually do quite a few things that are similar in the BA, it's, it's the BA is kind of a more of a catch-all, I guess you would say, um, but the BIS is more specifically tailored towards those sorts of employment opportunities I was talking about a bit earlier. So it's kind of a little more focused um, it, on, on its, its interest in international affairs and humanitarian assistance and those sorts of things, social reform, um, you know, international programs that, that way. That's not to say students can't do part of the BAs in their BA, and we have quite a few students that um, that do pick up the units as electives because they're interested in that sort of thing. Classically, uh, students who are doing the BA, but the BA in psychology will also pick up BA student units as well because it's it's kind of part of it. So, um, in short, highly focused and more sort of more specialised, more generic and, and general catch all is the rule. It's a bit more complicated than that, but really that's simply how the best way to understand it. Thanks for that, Tony. Riley, a, sorry, Riley, did you have a, you know, a reason why you chose the BAS over the BA? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. So kind of what Tony said is that the BA is kind of like a big umbrella, whereas the international studies is just a bit more focused. Um, the reason why I chose it, I originally studied criminology and then moved over onto it. So they're both covered under the BA um, and I could have done just a BA and done majored in criminology or international studies and swapped over it like that. But yeah, definitely because it's a more specialized focused. Um, and if you're definitely interested in it, I would probably recommend the international studies degree rather than the arts, just because you get that more focused um, and immersive experience. Um, not to say that doing the BA and majoring in international studies is any less. Um, it's just, you'll get more out of it, I believe. Fantastic. Thanks for that. And um, just to you know, clarify, you can major in international relations in the BA, but the international studies degree does have some core units that are only available to BIS students. Um, Kai, maybe I can actually ask you a little bit about this because I think it's a really interesting 
distinction between the BA and the BIS and this identity of the BIS. Um, what's what's your take on the the main difference? You know, I think it's I think it is about an umbrella idea and a more focused specialization. Is there anything else you could add to that? I think at the moment, I mean, the aim of the BIS is that we give people disciplinary knowledge through the major, but also there's an explicit focus on developing transferable skills. Um, so I think this speaks to a lot of the questions we get about, you know, what do people do with their Bachelor of International Studies? The aim is not to prepare you to be a diplomat. It's not the aim to prepare you to go and work in a particular thing. What we want is people who are personally and professionally ready to go into intercultural and international environments and be confident that they have the skills to adapt quickly and to succeed. So, you know, if you're working for a law firm, if you're working in a business and they say, we want to open an office in Mongolia next year, um, rather, if you're the sort of person who goes, hey, that sounds really interesting, the BIS is going to be the sort of course that really gives you an opportunity to explore and to develop your capacities to be able to take up that opportunity and not just survive, but thrive in it. The BA in comparison, it could do all of that, but it gives you less structure to do that. And that comes because you've got so much breadth. You've got such a big choice of majors. Um, so exactly as other people have said, one of the things we see is that often people start with the BA because it gives you that maximum choice. And then, as Riley mentioned, it may be switching into the Bachelor of International Studies um, as you know, your thinking advances in terms of what you want to do and just how to get there. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Kai and Riley and Tony uh, for answering that question. Um, I've got another question from the audience, which is how much contact time will I have with staff? Uh, Tony, you teach one of our, our big first year units in the BIS. Maybe you could field this one for us and then uh, maybe we could go to Riley and just see what his experience of that is after that. Uh, for sure. And um, once again, like all my other questions, the answer is uh, very mixed and very broad. Uh, so, for example, in my first year units, we tend to have a fair bit more contact that'll either be, uh, you know, as a one hour, what we used to be called a lecture, but, you know, it's, it's largely a sort of a, a class, we call it now, and then a seminar or tutorial uh, as well. And then indirect connections as well via the cloud and Zoom. So probably in first year at, at units that are quite, study-based, you know, face-to-face, -face, I'm going to say traditional, more traditional units, probably a higher contact. And then there's the stuff you do yourself out of hours. And students do contact each other. They have networks, you know, they use social software to talk to each other. So it's it's quite intensive in first year. By second year, it, it sort of changes a little bit. It shifts. It's still fairly intensive. And you do send, tend to have much more contact with staff. But by third year, we tend to see students developing sort of in, a bit more independence, they're, they're often doing internships, long placements, um, and that they become more independent learners. Certainly, they come back to you know to classes and stuff, but it kind of tapers over time as you you get more into the applied learning. I guess um, I, I tend to see students in my units for at least a couple of hours face to face a week. Quite a bit of virtual presence now. We're a bit used to that now. Uh, I do a lot of stuff, particularly with third year students on Zoom. You know, we literally have a chat. Yeah, very similar to this and um, that's one of the few good things to come out of COVID is that we really do have an opportunity to use, use mixed methods now and people accept them they're used to them we know uh, how it works um Robert, what about you how was your your contact over the duration of your degree what year are you in now you might want to tell people that so I'm in my third year um going into my fourth year next year um just because I decided to extend my degree but yeah it really depends on how much you want to talk to your professors and stuff. So usually you have about four units um, over the trimester. Um, it's not like high school where you're stuck with your teacher from nine to three. Um, it's usually about an hour lecture and then an hour seminar. Um, but of course you can extend that more if you want to. Um, if you're a really good professor that you really enjoy talking to or has like a specific specialization that you want to do, um, definitely get a lot more contact hours with them because you'll be talking to them more. Um, so yeah, I think it's really up to you as an individual on how much contact hours you get. So currently I'm do only doing the one unit. So I have about three contact hours um, and then just a little bit more if I need to go over something else that's covered over the lecture, but yeah. Great, thanks very much for that, Tony and Riley. And I'd just like to say that, um, you know, that what Riley picked up on there was really important that we do have those structured class hours 
but a lot of lectures are available outside those times for consultation and and general so you know we are we are able to communicate outside of those very structured hours but um yeah there is a, there is generally a minimum that is definitely uh something that you should explore and engage with in your first year to get the maximum out of your degree um okay so i've got a question from ava and it's a fairly simple one, but quite interesting, I think. Uh, and it's about what double degrees are available with international studies. And um, very quickly, it's commerce and law, but maybe Kai, you'd like to talk about the difference between that and why a student would like to maybe study a combined degree versus the straight Bachelor of International Studies, and maybe even the difference between that and the Global Scholar Program, if that's okay. Yeah, certainly can't, no problem. So yeah, exactly as you've just said, there are two double degrees, um, which is with the Bachelor of Commerce and also the B-Laws, BIS. Um, what this does mean for both of them is that you do take fewer units in the Bachelor of International Studies. So rather than the straight Bachelor of International Studies will be 24 credit points, you have to lose some to fit everything in. Um, so you come down to 16 credit points on the Bachelor of International Studies side. It does also involve an increase in length of time. So for the Bachelor of International Studies, Bachelor of Commerce, it will take you up to four years. And for the Bachelor of Laws, BIS, it will take you up to five years because effectively you're getting two qualifications from it. So there's minimum standards on that and making sure that you can complete all of the requirements, particularly with law. So just to, to add on the final one of that, in addition to that, we've also got the Bachelor of International Studies Global Scholar. Um, that one is the same structure as the Bachelor of International Studies, but with an enhanced international experience requirement of at least four, four credit points rather than two and with a compulsory internship. So if you're the sort of person who's already determined to get overseas, determined to really go and fit all of those international experiences in, and you've got some ideas about the sort of things you want to do, then certainly take a look at the Global Scholar. Um, and the big advantage of that is that it does come with some funding support to go towards the internship at, at the end as well. Um, why would you do a double degree rather than just a straight Bachelor of International Studies? Possibly because you've got two interest areas, um, possibly because you've been looking at a Bachelor of Laws or a Bachelor of Commerce and going, looks really great, but I want something a bit different and I want to keep my options open or I want to differentiate myself. Um, so in that sense, it's a way to find complementary areas and realise that you know, really keep those doors open for you. We know, for example, that with the Bachelor of Laws, a lot of people will qualify, spend some time studying law, but then want to go and do something else. And law is a fantastic education thinking as well as a qualification for a profession. But pairing it with the international side of things really means that you're going to be able to take it that step forward that step further. Similarly, if you're looking at commerce, interest in the business world, we may say that money makes the world go round, but there's many other things as well, particularly politics and particularly political economy. And the BIS side of your studies will give you the opportunity to explore that and really gain a good understanding of it. So with the aim that they come back together at the end. So it, it's not a it's not a question of trying to cram everything in and it just fits. It's a question of saying this can really be something that enhances every aspect of your learning experience that gives you more opportunities, but that also can speak to your interests in a, a very sort of fundamental way where it's not an either or choice. It's do both. Love it. And that's that's exactly the message that if any student was asking me for advice and they said, I've got these two areas of interest, I'd say start out with both. And you never know, you can always change your degree at Deakin, you're not locked in from the start as well. And that's a really important message that I think our first year students really need to, to hear is that, you know, you just start and, you know, if you if you like one area more than another area, you're always able to change into a different degree as well. Um, I know that I uh, changed quite a few times in my first year at university. So it's definitely something that doesn't always set you back in your career either. I, I actually really encourage students to think about it. Um, okay, so Riley, I actually did want to talk to you about two things. Um, changing degrees uh, and also what the clubs do at Deakin. So I know that we've got very limited time. Um, and maybe I'll just quickly start with a quickly about why you changed degrees and then maybe just if you're involved in any clubs and what you're doing. You accidentally muted yourself at the end of it, but I think I got the idea of the question. So why I changed degrees. So I did criminology in year 12 as part of the Deakin Accelerate program. And in, in my first year, um, I loved it. There's nothing wrong with it. So if you are thinking of doing criminology, 
do it. Um, the only reason why I changed is not what I wanted to do as a career. So one of my units was kind of focusing around international crime and stuff like that, um, genocide and et cetera. Um, and that's where kind of my interest in like refugee rights in particular came from. So to get that more focused approach on human rights, I then changed over to this degree because it kind of better suited my interests, even though I didn't really consider it beforehand. Um, and that's kind of the good thing about Deakin is that as long as you kind of show that you can do level uh, university level work, um, you can transfer into most degrees. Of course, stuff like law, you'll have to have a higher grade average, but yeah, it's really good to kind of, if you don't enjoy a degree first year, transfer over, um, you'll thank yourself later because you'll be doing something that you love. Um, touching on the clubs, so that's run by DUSA, which is a student association. Um, so many different clubs and such. So some that I was a part of, the Potato Cake Appreciation Society, even though it's not related to international studies, but you have those fun ones. But then you have your more academic ones like the International Affairs Club, which I was a part of um, before COVID. So we just went around to like different um, like pubs and stuff like that and just kind of talked about international affairs. Nothing really too academic, but still kind of, if you're doing this degree, you're going to be international Inter interested in international affairs so it's kind of good to have that group of people that also had to share shared the same interests as you but yeah fantastic thanks for that riley now i've got time for two more questions uh i've got one for um kai and that is um let's sorry i'm just a quick he's going up there what's the popular combinations for majors in the bis yeah, good question. Um, I mentioned earlier that the majority of students do take international relations as their major. Um, it goes very well with pol politics and policy studies in particular, so that's a very popular combination. Um, people who are looking beyond that, we also see people go with anthropology, which actually marries very well with international relations. One does everything top down, the other one does bottom up effectively. Um, so putting the people back into the study as well. So those would be two of the main ones. We've also had questions about languages um, and they are less popular by number, but certainly we see people get very passionate about the majors there and the opportunities it affords them. And certainly I would encourage everyone to at least take one or two units of a language just for the experience, because it's not just about learning the words, it's also about learning another culture, getting a different perspective on the world. So even if you're not going to be fluent, it's still going to be a, a good experience and one that's very positive for you personally and professionally. Um, other than that, people do tend to switch between it. And that's the other thing that's really worth mentioning with the Bachelor of International Studies, not the combined degrees I'd hasten to add, is that you have got space to take a second major and it doesn't just have to be one of the, the ones that is listed within that. So if you did want to do international relations as your, your main major, your first one, and then take a minor say in criminology or in one of the, the other subjects that's available within the Bachelor of, International, Bachelor of Arts, then you have got a huge range that you can pick up from on that. So the flexibility is really there. Um, it's another one of starting off sensibly, so picking up what you're more confident with in your first year, so that then you've got time to plan how you're going to fit the rest of your degree together as effectively as possible. Fantastic and really wonderful uh, way to kind of summarise uh, what you can and can't do in your degree and, and the kind of the flexibility that we do offer. Uh, Tony, I'd like to finish with you. Uh, and this is just because Riley brought up the Japanese program. Uh, and I know that you lead that program. Um, can you tell us just very quickly what that program is in maybe 30 seconds, if possible? I can. Uh, look, look, it's a mixture of intensive, hands-on, real-world experience of, of the political system, social systems, cultural systems in Japan. You spend time with uh, Masashi University, being, if you want, a Japanese uh, university student for a little while, you visit key areas like Hiroshima, but not as a tourist, but as a sort of an anthropologist, I guess, looking at the people, finding out about um, what it was like, survivor stories, learning about cultural practices, learning about political systems, uh, and those sort of social things that you don't pick up as a tourist, the things that are below the waterline that you only learn through immersion. Um, you, you come home. We also learn a little Japanese while we're there um, and uh, go in and sit in on classes as a Japanese student. So 30 seconds done. 
Fantastic. Thanks for that, Tony. Um, and look, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you to all of you for joining us. It's really great to see so many of you interested in international studies and to receive so many questions. If we have not yet responded to your question again, please join our all day web chat at the bottom right of your screen where expert staff are ready to answer your questions. If you'd like to learn more, you'll also find lots of really useful resources on our Deakin Open Day website that we encourage you to explore. Thanks for your time and we hope to see you at Deakin soon.